Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Investing with Tom podcast. Now, as you can see by the title of this one, we have a very popular returning guest in the form of Guy Spear of Aquamarine Capital. Now, uh, Guy was actually a guest on the podcast earlier this year. Unfortunately, he was a little under the weather at the time, so we had to cut that episode slightly shorter than we had initially planned. But a big thank you to Guy for coming on to do uh, a much longer episode, uh, which you're, you're about to see here. So uh, Guy is someone who I actually got to meet for the first time in person just a few weeks back in Omaha, Nebraska, where we both attended the Birch Hathaway annual meeting. So great to meet Guy in the flesh. Guy is a super nice individual, as you'll uh, see in this episode, and it's no different uh, kind of meeting him in person as well. And in this episode, we covered a hugely wide range of topics. Now, Guy, uh, over the past few years, has built up this reputation for being extremely good at not selling. Uh, we often see some of his portfolio activity, and uh, there's really not a whole lot. He's pretty good at basically just buying great businesses, minimizing the frictional costs of brokerage and paying taxes, and kind of shuffling around in a amongst those companies and he really just sits back and lets the great businesses do their thing. And uh, we covered a couple of the key maybe lessons and experiences from the past that have potentially influenced Guy to behave in that way. You know, uh, Guy shared a story on this episode that he's really never uh, put out there in the public domain around one of the biggest mistakes that he made in his investment career, which was basically to sell a company after a significant price drop where the company was going through very real issues. But uh, looking back at it now, if he had continued to hold that business, it would have been well more than a 100x return from when he sold those shares. So uh, very interesting to hear that story from Guy and very thankful to Guy for, for uh, sharing that experience with the people uh, that will watch and listen to this episode. Uh, and in the second half of this episode, I actually put a lot of your questions to Guy. So uh, before going into this one, I collected a lot of questions from both YouTube and also Twitter. Uh, so we kind of just went through a Q&A type format and uh, got guys thoughts on a whole range of topics so if you do enjoy this one be sure to hit like and also subscribe to the investing with tom podcast channel if you haven't already that way you can see future episodes as soon as they go live but for now let's roll this episode with none other than guy spear guy uh welcome back to the podcast it's it's great to have you on how are you i'm doing great and even better for being with you tom and for having met you in real life in Omaha and having discovered that you're way taller than I expected you to be. <laughs> but, um, but having met you once makes a big difference. It's very, I have a different impression of you. Uh, I, the funny thing is, is that I feel like you are, you are more mature than I expected you to be. It's not just that you're taller, but there's, I, I know something about your personality from your presence, the way you move around people, the way you interact with them. It just shows the benefit of being in real life with somebody rather than just being on a screen with them. There is a difference. Yeah, for sure. It was great to get back to Omaha. Great to meet you in person. Great to meet a whole bunch of people, actually. I was blown away at the number of people. Like I, I came back and just looked at my bookshelf for a couple of minutes, and I was like, that guy was there, that guy was there, that guy was there, and probably knocked off about a third of the bookshelf, I think. So it's a pretty amazing thing that that all of these people kind of congregate in in one place in the world well pretty amazing for me is that people like you're there from new zealand and i've never been to new zealand and i haven't even been to australia that often but that i can come to omaha and then hang out with you all the way from new zealand and that i think that the people who live far closer and don't travel to it even though they express interest in warren buffett and uh value investing as doing themselves in in such a major way it's really shocking and surprising to me how few people make it given how beneficial it is for those who do and i really appreciate you coming from new zealand i mean that's like a two-day trip just to get into the general time zone it, it is a long trip but it was definitely worth it yeah absolutely and i, I thank you for coming and uh the funny thing is, is that I knew that I wouldn't have time to do what we're doing right now in Omaha. It would have been ridiculous. But I did say to Chantal that given the distances that I'm aware of from your side of the world, I said, well, he can always come visit us in Zurich. We'll put him up. And that's only a 10-hour flight, which is kind of like local for you when, you, when you're when you in Asia, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, what was it like being being back in Omaha after after a three year break? Because I I understand that you basically go every year, kind of pre COVID. Yeah. So, what was it like after having a few years? I mean, I have to confess that before? my first meeting was 1995, and then there were a couple of meetings in the ni- late 90s that I missed. I cannot believe I did that. That what a what a how did I do myself in? Um, but then I've 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 been pretty much in in the 2000s. I went to every single meeting. Um, I mean, you know, I think that that. Uh, Charlie Munger is right. It is a celebration. It's a celebration of so many things. But also, and I, I don't know if Charlie Munger would agree with me or not, it's it's more than a celebration. It's a pilgrimage. And, um, you know, I don't know a lot about pilgrimages, but uh, a pilgrimage is about a journey to a place. It's about the changes in you on the journey to that place. It's about the people that you meet on that journey Jeffrey Chaucer wrote a whole book, The Canterbury Tales, about the tales that people told on their journey to Canterbury, on their pilgrimage to Canterbury. And um, I think that, uh, so for me, it really is a pilgrimage. I don't mind calling it that. I don't, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't mind if people think that I'm part of a cult by saying that. And what do I mean by pilgrimage? It's, it's, a, it's a, a journey done with intent, and it's with the intent to become a different person as a result of that journey. And that's what I think that so many people who are just observers don't understand about the Berkshire thing. So it's not just that I got to meet you, Tom, it's that I, and others, it's that I reinforce values that uh, 25 years ago and activities and behaviors and orientation towards the world that I only very, very vaguely perceived and grasped not very well. And, and, And I knew that I wanted that. And, and so how do you get that? Well, you, you undertake the pilgrimage. And by, through the act of undertaking the pilgrimage and being yourself, but engaging with it and being a participant in it, not just being an observer, then, then you know, so the, the bottom line, pilgrimages, when you pick the places that you do a pilgrimage to uh, and the, the crowd that you do a pilgrimage with, that can change your life in ways that you cannot even imagine, which is why I deeply respect people. In a certain way, you had to make more effort to undertake the pilgrimage, if you describe it for yourself as a pilgrimage. Uh, but the benefits are even greater, if you like, because of the extra effort that was involved. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was awesome, <laughs> and uh, it was it was lovely to reconnect with people that I hadn't seen for a long time, to be in the in the arena with Warren. To be hanging out in the queue on the on the Saturday morning very very early, but and but what was even and I think that one thing that I learned I mean I learned some things at the meeting this time even though it's, I've been to more than twenty meetings, but I think that something that I will do next time is I will actually be more conscious of this idea of pilgrimage and sort of say what are the decisions that I want to take during my quote, pilgrimage or my visit to Omaha? What are the things that I want to clarify in my mind? What is my intent? So we, when we set an intent before we do something, it's even more powerful. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> and I think that, interestingly enough, the power of the meeting to impact somebody's life uh, rises with time. And the reason why it rises with time is that every meeting, you know more people and it's those close human connections and bonds that and ties and relationships that actually create the change. And so, you know, imagining a kind of like a spider's web, the first time you go to the meeting, there's only a few strands of that web that have been woven. But every time you go, the strands are already there get strengthened and new strands get woven. And, um, and so you become more, very, very much more firmly embedded. So it's hilarious for me. Tom, that today people, you know, I love this idea to seek not the masters, seek what they sought. So people kind of approaching me as if I'm um, somebody to emulate and follow and listen to. And I tell them, hey, don't seek me, seek what I've been seeking. But they perceive me as being so at the center of it. And, and, and 20 years ago, I was not at the center of that. The only other thing I would add, Tom, is that what's great about this pilgrimage idea is that we don't have to just do a pilgrimage to Berkshire Hathaway every year. We can do. We can do, undertake other kinds of pilgrimages. I mean, I think that um, the uh, 
I've never been a Grateful Dead fan, and uh, I've met a few, and I don't even understand the Grateful Dead's music. It's not something that appeals to me, but but the few that I've met and those I've read about, for them, the Grateful Dead concerts and, and being a deadhead is a kind of a pilgrimage. They were buying into a, a whole bunch of values and a lifestyle and a brotherhood and, and sisterhood, and um, there's nothing wrong with being... I actually think that probably being a deadhead, there are things that conflict with being a value investor. But but my point is that, that, you know, if there's a, there's a festival, there's a music festival in um, Salzburg, a classical musical festival. And, you know, the people who attend that festival quote religiously every year, they're kind of dedicating themselves to music. Obviously they're dedicating themselves to classical music, to a certain vision of European culture, to a certain vision of who they want to be. So we don't have to undertake just one pilgrimage in our lives. We can undertake multiple pilgrimages and and select them in terms of who we want to become, you know? So so many people go to the Edinburgh Festival. I mean, that's more of a kind of an arts festival, but, um, you know, people go to Varanasi in India. People who are not Hindus go to Varanasi in India. I don't fully understand that. It's not something that I'm close to. But my point is, um, if we cast out the idea of pilgrimage as being an old fangled uh, religious idea that is not relevant to us today. There's, we're missing something about how human beings are put together. We're missing something about how uh, we can act on ourselves to, to impact our destiny. And nobody's saying that we should undertake religious pilgrimages to Mecca or to Canterbury, or you know, there's people who do this Santiago de Compostela in, in Spain. But you know, pick your values, pick your values, pick your heroes, and undertake that pilgrimage. You and I are part of the value crowd, so our pilgrimage is to Berkshire Hathaway, you know? Yeah, I really like that. And uh, I do owe you a thanks as well, Guy, for a couple of things. Firstly, for spending time with me on this podcast. And um, mm. I know the the audience really enjoys listening to you, but I also owe you a thanks because you very kindly uh, invited me to the Aquamarine Fund Dinner, which was a lot of fun. You had absolutely no obligation to do that, but uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, did you meet some good people? I did. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I met some good people throughout the entire weekend, really, from Matt Peterson's yeah. barbecue to in the line to the to the dinner. But um, yeah, it's just it's I, it's just great to be surrounded by a lot of people with similar interests. I guess. I was bummed not to be uh, at Matthew Peterson's barbecue, and and I've co-hosted that with him in years yeah. past, but. I was invited to a dinner with Warren Buffett's assistant and that took priority for me and <laughs> fair enough. That was a lovely dinner. And I think that, I mean, yeah, I mean, so you start, I started off the first five years I went to the meeting. The only thing I do that I remember is go to Gorats and meet random people at Gorats sit with man, yeah. random people and meet them. And so, you know, that was a kind of a, and then suddenly you get to a place where somebody invites you to a dinner and you meet a whole bunch of really great people, and then and so that's kind of an acceleration. And suddenly you're no longer you're no longer with a faceless crowd of forty thousand people. You're with, you know, old friends. Yep. <laughs> and I was very happy to have you at the dinner. Thank you yeah, for well, coming. Well, I, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Um, um, within two years, Tom, if you return, and I realize it's a huge way for you to come. You you may well be in a position where you tell me, Guy, I would love to come to your dinner, but I've been invited to dot, 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 X, Y, Z, and I just have to go. I'm sure you'll understand. And I'll say, of course I understand, but that's very likely to happen, I can tell you. Well, time time will tell. <laughs> we'll check in in a couple of years. Yeah, I think um, so. Look, Guy, there's a, there's a few things that um, I've kind of got got noted down here that I wanted to, wanted to talk to you about. And then I've really just kind of put it out to the audience on YouTube and I put up a, a tweet the other day kind of asking basically what's on people's mind and what they want to hear you talk about. So I think it'd be cool just to kind of spend a lot of time working through people's questions really. But um, yeah. before we so get happy to, that, to do that, but before we get to that, I mean, we were talking just briefly before we hit record here about um, some of the I, I guess I'm not sure how you want to describe it. Maybe some of the valuation craziness that's that's starting to come back to earth, and um, and a lot of people kind of having a bit of a tough time, particularly if they're tech investors or were invested in some of these high flying growth companies. And um, 
you kind of said, you know, valuation still matters. It, it turns out. I, I was wondering if you could, if you could speak to that a little. Yeah, I'm. We, we took, for the listener, we talked a little bit about this beforehand. I'm going to, Tom, uh, use a, a slightly different analogy. We can go back to what what we talked about as well. Sure. But um, I'm not a good golf player. I don't play a lot of golf. But we all dream of getting those of us who've played any golf at all. We all dream of getting onto the green. Going, going to the, you know, hitting a drive that goes straight down the fairway and hits the, you know, lands on the green. We all dream of hitting those perfect golf shots. And golf is a stra- strange game that even if you're not very good, as I am certainly not, um, every now and then, even somebody's not very good hits a shot that looks like Tiger Woods could have hit it. And it's like, my God, I'm a freaking genius. And that's what we live for. And it makes us feel great. But the real game of golf happens when we when we take a when I take a sod of earth and the golf ball goes straight into the trees and and it's just horrible and I've lost a ball and all of those things. That's where the game of golf really begins, actually. So so uh, this great friend who's actually an investor who comes to the Berkshire meeting, Aaron Bird. You should interview him. He's a lovely guy. He kind of got me into golf. He was an intern of mine. And sorry, while I go on about him. He's the guy who connected me to Warren Buffett. Uh, he said golf is a game of adversity. It's a game of managing adversity. The real game of golf, the inner game of golf, is, yeah, every now and then you get a celebration when you feel like you're Tiger Woods. But most of the time, it's managing that adversity that you get into. And so we can imagine, you know, when I when I buy Raffles Education Corp, which I did, I don't know how long ago, and it goes up 6x, that's like hitting that beautiful golf shot down the fairway. But that's not actually the game of investing. That's kind of like the icing on the cake. The game of investing is when you hit adversity and we all hit adversity. So I think that the first thing that I would say to those people who are licking their wounds with uh, some kind of either realized or hopefully unrealized losses in their portfolio is to realize that this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where things really get started. This is where you get the opportunity to prove uh, your greatness. And to just reference, um, uh, Marcus Aurelius says it so well. So uh, forgive me if this is already well known to you. He's approached by one of his generals and he say, you know, it's so difficult. The enemy is so strong. Our troops are so tired. You know, they, our weapons are not as great. The weather's bad. The conditions are bad. So I might have to go out and fight this battle for you. And Marcus Aurelius's response to the general in one of his writings and meditations, he says, oh, yeah, I understand. You want to be virtuous. You want to have fortitude. You want to have courage. But you don't actually want to prove them on the battlefield. You, know, you just want to have those virtues. And life doesn't work that way. The way life works is that you actually have to prove those virtues in real life if you believe you have them. And so uh, this is the opportunity to be heroic and, and to prove and discover the virtues that we have inside of us. And in a certain way, I think that it's it's sort of strange because we all have those virtues. So the virtues are ones of fortitude, patience, looking at reality in the eye, acknowledging our mistakes, uh, making the best decisions today. And the key is that all we have to do is decide we want to have those virtues and then take those actions. And... Um, so the story that for those listeners who are interested that I told Tom that I don't I've told it privately but I've haven't, haven't told it publicly uh, in in this kind of forum so and I'm really happy to do it is the story of my experience with laboratory corporations of, of America um, you know this all happened in the early 2000s so there I was I'd actually had the opportunity to to shake hands with Lou Simpson who was one of Warren Buffett's lieutenants, an extremely talented and capable investor who suddenly a new position appears in his portfolio, a company called Laboratory Corporation of America. And this was a merger between a company called Bioreference Labs, which was partly owned by uh, Roche in Switzerland and National Health Labs, which was an American company. And this was the, the, the uh, future of uh, lab testing, blood lab testing was high capital expenditures, but many, many tests, which would be very expensive and only capable of being done by the largest, most capitalized labs. And so this was clearly going to be one of the winners in a consolidating industry. 
uh, uh, and there was potentially one competitor emerging, and they'd taken a certain amount of, on a certain amount of debt to do the merger, and there was years of endless growth ahead of them. And then they, they had a, what I remember as a technical default on their debt, and the share price rapidly dropped from eight dollars a share, approximately, which is where I had bought it, to two dollars a share. And uh, so, so at that point, so far, so good. Because um, that is just the normal course of business in the stock market. Things happen. <laughs> Things don't always turn out the way you expect them to. The last five or six years or it has been a very unusual period. And again, that's where the rubber hits the road. And for the benefit of the viewer, I did not do. I made a number of really big mistakes uh, or a number of errors that I would have preferred, I would prefer not to have made. So first of all, nothing other than a quotational loss, and you're talking about 75% loss on my uh, purchase, uh, which is about what some people have in some of their SaaS tech businesses. And, um, but nothing else had happened. Nobody was yelling, you idiot. The, no, nobody was telling me to sell the shares. Uh, I don't know what would have happened when I reported uh, to investors if I would have gotten redemption requests or not. But at this point, none of that has happened. Um, so a, a first mistake is that I went into a funk. All I could do was think about this company. I had other companies in my portfolio, but all I could do was think about this company and how much money I'd lost on a quotational loss. And um, in this case, the bankers were Credit Suisse. And they had a very close relationship with Roche. And they, um, they took a penalty from the company and they modified the loan agreement. So it wasn't like the company was about to go into Chapter 11 or anything like that. It had a solid set of shareholders who were totally capable, if necessary, of recapitalizing the company. But that wasn't even necessary. They just needed a modification on one of the um, uh, sort of covenants on the loan, as I remember. In any case, I couldn't think of anything else. And eventually the pressure came too great for me and I sold the shares at $2 a share and felt so much better afterwards because the position was cleared out and I didn't have to think about it anymore. And uh, that was that. And I tried to forget I ever owned it and tried to forget that I ever bought it. Uh, five or six later, years later, I discovered that uh, Chieftain Capital Management uh, owned shares of the company. I don't remember the name of the guy leading it. Of kind of like buy and hold long term investors. In any case, the results for the company were that it was more from the two dollars a share. It ended up at more than a hundred or two hundred x, perhaps even more. It's too painful for me to do the study. The most profound fact about that is that if all I had done was done nothing, if I just held on to my shares at eight dollars a share. I would have made well more, well more than a lot more than twenty times my original investment. Twenty times my original analysis was right. Uh, all I had to do was sit there and do nothing, and I failed to do that. I so in retrospect, did I pay too much for the company? Perhaps at that particular moment, and I bought into the flush of excitement at the merger and the fact that Lou Simpson had bought a bunch of shares, and I was I bought in the midst of enthusiasm, but then I double down on that mistake uh, by selling it at the wrong time. And so, you know, I think that many investors right now are waking up to realize that they've made the mistake of overpaying. But I think that in many cases that I know of, um, they've actually bought into some extraordinary businesses. And what Charlie Munger says is that Often the, the 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 pain in the markets happen not because of a bad idea, because of a bad idea, but because of a good idea that was taken too far. And so many of these companies are extremely well managed. They have some super high quality people running them. Uh, they are not all of them, but some of them, and perhaps many of them, are extraordinarily good businesses. I believe that those people that I know who are invested in them have done good research, excellent research, beyond excellent research. And yes, perhaps they've paid too much for them, which is easy to see now. But it would be a great shame to compound that mistake by um, uh, by selling at the wrong time, <laughs> if you like. And and so that was a signal lesson to me. And uh, perhaps that is helpful for some people who are sort of licking wounds right now 
And the one other thing that I would share that is, doesn't originate from me, but this concept of freezing of position, uh, of saying, you know what, this is extraordinarily painful for me. I can't believe it's gone down so much. But I'm aware that, so the, what I say for myself is, uh, I understand now from my experience in Laboratory Corporation of America, how I was actually, I sold irrationally. But in the moment when I sold, I didn't believe I was being irrational. So um, the, the, the emotional brain is so powerful that it can convince the rational brain that, uh, so it, the emotional brain will take over the rational brain and convince the rational brain that's acting rationally when actually it's the emotional brain that's taken over the steering wheel. And one way to avoid that kind of mistake is to just say, you know, when I'm feeling this extraordinary pain uh, over a quotation loss, for example, I'm not going to allow any action, period. I'm just going to freeze it. I'm just going to do nothing. And that's just the way it's going to be. And it's f fascinating to me how the people who seem to do the best in the markets are the people who do less. And so to find ways to convince ourselves to do less is a good thing. And um, this period, will will uh, there will be a lot of people who stop talking about their portfolios, who quietly go out of business. But if those and and I, but I urge those of you who are listening, who are determined to stick around, this is your opportunity, not to shine necessarily, but to survive. And sometimes surviving is enough, you know. And 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 don't don't uh, don't set too high standards for yourself. This is an extraordinary difficult thing, and sometimes surviving is thriving. How did I do, Tom? That was great. I appreciate you sharing that, guy. Um... I see a lot of people kind of, you know, sharing your 13 Fs and things and uh, referring to you as the master of doing nothing. I think maybe not quite rival rivaling Charlie, but, you know, aspiring to that level, I think. And, and I can see that maybe those those past experiences have kind of seared that in. Um, I know you're an extensive user of checklists as well. Are, are those experiences you just described was that sort of the genesis for setting up investment checklists also? Um, so one thing is, is that people are focused on the 13 Fs, but uh, they're not aware of what I have outside of sure. the US, which I'm quite happy not to share. <laughs> I <laughs> Fair enough. To. And, Fair um, enough. But for what it's worth, uh, you probably, if you look in India, you'll see me as a, showing up as a shareholder, at least in a couple of companies. But interesting enough, I haven't done made any moves there either. So uh, the portfolio has stayed pretty static through this period. I think that you know, I, I actually a big change for me is that my letters can now be read by everyone. So you're welcome to go read those letters. And um, I think that you know, I, I'm almost has. It's not that I'm hesitant. It's I'm. This is kind of like the big secret me or a big secret that's been revealed to me recently is that William Green uh, in talking about Nick Sleep talk in Richer, Wiser, Happier talks about destination al analysis. Uh, look at where you want to end up and then rewind from there. And I think that there are so many businesses that I've watched friends of mine own where I just say, I can't see the destination. It looks really sexy right now, but what's the destination? And if the destination is not somewhere that I want to be, then um, then uh, uh, I'm not going to invest in it. And I, I just have to take a, a, a mating analogy, human mating analogy. So, you know, if, I don't know, are you single, Tom? No. You're not single. Are you married? Uh, you married? No, I'm not married. No? Okay, partnered up. So, but the thing is, is that I experienced when I was way younger, maybe many of us have experienced the thing of the one night stand or the, or the, you know, drunken night in a bar. And then there's a kind of the wolf syndrome where you want to bite your arm off because you find your arm off somebody underneath somebody that you really don't want to be around the next morning. That is an example of not engaging in destination analysis. Uh, an example of engaging in destination analysis is to only hang out and certainly only go home with people you'd want to spend the rest of your life with because then the destination is a positive destination. You never ever in investing want to wake up and discover that the thing that you thought you were getting married to really ought to have been a one-night stand. And so um, 
every single company. And I've, I've done this with companies where people say this is a spectacular business and they're making so much money and they're not that expensive. And my answer to them is yes, but I don't know where the end point is. I don't know where they end up and I want to know where they end up. And when you know, when you know, every single company in your portfolio is one where I can see my way to an end point that is a good and positive end point that I want to be in, then that's something that you want to own for life. That's something you want to be married to. And so people in this period are waking up to, you know, to use the analogy that they, they took home uh, somebody as a partner and then they're waking up the next day and it ain't looking so good anymore and they want to chew their arm off. And what you really want to do is make sure that whatever, you know, company you take home with you to get is one that you actually want to get married to. And you know, every single company that's in my portfolio, I want to be married to that company effectively. And so why would I change? And, and I, you know, it, it's actually the letter was really, really well timed because I, I talked about going into inflation and higher interest rates in a time of extraordinary uncertainty. And I asked myself, and I asked the reader, you know, where do you want to be uh, as you go through this period? And the answer, and I reasoned through to an answer, which basically says, you want to be in these businesses. And, you know, maybe there's a selection of the businesses that you want to, this is where you want to be. And, uh, you know, just very briefly, I, you know, I used the analogy of, um, if we just imagine all stock investing is real estate, if you already own the best real estate in town, you own the best office building, you own the best McDonald's franchise, you own the best shopping mall right down there next to Trump Tower, let's say. And the storm is coming, whatever it is. Do you really want to go and buy warehouses on the edge of town? Do you really want to sell your real estate and buy ca and hold cash or anything else? Or you just, you, do you want to continue to own? Sorry, there's something in my throat. Hopefully that takes care of it. Or do you want to own the best assets you can possibly find? And my answer is to own the best assets I can possibly find. And so that's why there's zero portfolio turnover. In terms of checklists, um, I don't think that the checklists have helped me to lower my portfolio turnover. I think it's really this concept of destination analysis, knowing where you want to end up and not doing anything that is this inconsistent with that outcome which basically means that 98% of possible actions in the stock market are ones that you end up not taking for that reason. You know, I'll give you one example that, uh, and I hope I'm not pouring fuel on a, on a burning fire, but, um, you know, if, if I was a trader type, what I'd really like to do right now is short tether because, because I think that, you know, in the crypto world, and I know I've just made a whole bunch of crypto enemies right there, <laughs> but but the destination there's there's no there's no conceivable good destination from that so i'm not going to do it for all sorts of reasons but but there are many examples of that um uh you know i was so so uh i was i was looking at a company called basic fit basic fit appears to be a phenomenal business they they run um low cost gyms in europe and um it's uh, really well managed and it's a good business. It generates a lot of free cash and it's got scale economies and they're going good places and uh, the valuation was suppressed because uh, all sorts of growth aspects of the growth of the business were heavily dampened by um, COVID and lockdowns. But I don't know where that business ends up. I don't know what happens to health clubs in 20, 30 years. Maybe we're all working out at home. I've no idea. So it's just a, a no-go for me, even though I'm probably going to leave at least for a five or six or 10-year period a lot of money on the table. And I think that something that really, you know, this is one another one of the reasons why we go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. So during the financial crisis 10 years ago, I discovered that Berkshire Hathaway had loaned money to uh, Harley-Davidson. And Harley Davidson is a brand, was a brand that I really like. It's an iconic brand. Uh, you know, there's this wonderful statement that if you, you know, any brand that gets tattooed into people's arms is something that you want to own. I mean, that's kind of pretty amazing. And um, and then it was just phenomenal for me because the shareholders got the, the, one of the shareholders asked the question. I we they asked to Warren and Charlie. We saw that you had bought uh, some kind of uh, debt issuance of Harley Davidson. Did you consider buying the equity? And I kind of at the time would have thought that Harley Davidson would be the kind of brand that Berkshire Hathaway would love to buy. 
And um, Warren said something along the lines of, we're not so sure where the brand ends up, but we felt pretty confident that the debt was well covered and safe and it was offering a nice rate of interest. And, um, you know, so I think that Warren, again, there's no lesson that I've learned that I don't realize that Warren hasn't already learned it. And I think that he was engaging in a kind of destination analysis. And it's not enough for Warren to say, you know, to, to enjoy the idea that it's tattooed into people's arms and it's a well-known brand. No, he really thinks through to saying, is this kind of, is this something that will be around after the flood, after the apocalypse? You know, and, and I think that his conclusion was no, but the, 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 the secured debt was, was something that was okay to invest in, but the equity was not. And so one should have extraordinarily high standards about that destination. Now, the reason why I was hesitant is that I don't want everybody to think that way because that will take away opportunities for me. But, um, you know, we have, to, we have to be open and we have to teach and we have to be generous. So I'm doing it for that reason. And I realized that half, half of the, you know, you, something I learned from Monish, you can give your secret source away and people still won't implement it in their own lives. So, you know, and the world is big, but, um, but yeah, so that's really the reason why the zero turnover, I like what I own other than, other than, uh, well, I sold Twitter, you know, <laughs> which was, yeah. and I, I worry about saying that. And I already said it on, on Twitter because I don't want to start justifying every portfolio move, uh, in a podcast or elsewhere, but, um, yeah. But I'm and for what it's worth, I'm feeling unbelievably smart because I feel like I called it right. <laughs> and the bottom line was what I, what I said was I said. So the the story of my Twitter investment was that at the very beginning of lockdown, when I saw these um, businesses valuations go through the roof, so lockdown kind of accelerated a whole bunch of businesses that we know Netflix, Peloton, Zoom, and I kind of had not owned any of these new economy businesses and i understood that they were good businesses and i didn't like the valuations and i just said to myself at the beginning around the beginning of lockdown you know you have to at least own some of this to understand what it feels like to own it and so one of the companies i bought or the only company i bought was twitter and uh the reason why i bought it i'd never paid such a high valuation i was paying paying i believe about 10 times revenues I'd never paid such a high valuation for a company. Uh, and I, I can't, you know, my, my kind of like desire is more like 50% of revenues or less, <laughs> yeah. uh, something like that. You know, the Reverse point at which I bought Fiat. Days. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. That's more my style. Uh, but I said, hey, you got all done. And sometimes it's not enough just to watch. So why don't you just put some money into this and see what it looks like? And what I said to myself about Twitter was that I could see and understand how extraordinarily influential extraordinarily influential the platform was even if that wasn't translating into cash flows and uh, i believed as i guess elon musk believed that there were things that you could do with the platform to really make it shine and uh, so i bought it and i round tripped the share price so the share price doubled didn't pay a lot of attention to it so at that point it was more or less 20 times revenues and then it went back to around my purchase price then elon musk made the offer to buy it. And what really shocked me, I love the fact that Elon Musk was making the offer to buy it because I felt like his analysis coincided with mine. But what shocked me was that the company was so quick to say yes and to sign an agreement with him, which led me to believe that they were actually out of ideas and they were out of potential buyers. It really surprised me that, um, you know, uh, when, when, when LinkedIn was available for sale, I'm if my memory serves me right, Salesforce and Microsoft were both very interested in the company. And it would have been an extraordinary acquisition for Salesforce had they bought it. Microsoft ended up getting it. And if it hadn't been Salesforce or Microsoft, there are at least a few other businesses that would have been very happy, I think, to bid on it and to own it. Maybe IBM, maybe Oracle, uh, and perhaps others that I'm not even thinking of. And what, you know, so, so people who know way more than me did not want to bid on Twitter. Facebook didn't want to bid on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn or Microsoft didn't want to bid on Twitter. What What's going on there? Why? And so I realized that if the Elon Musk bid fell through, which I thought was very likely because I think Elon Musk is utter genius, a gift to humanity, but also highly erratic, 
then you know they'd be at the dance with no they, they'd have nobody to take them to the dance in a certain way they'd have no clothes on because the the fact that there was no competition on Elon Musk's bid revealed that there's some some serious issues with the business that restrained the Microsofts and the sales forces and the others the Facebooks of the world from wanting to bid on them and so uh you know it's one of the few times when I kind of said the the people are enthusiastic now's the time to set into that enthusiasm and I actually got it right and so I'm passing myself on the back a little bit because that's a bit of a you know every now and then if you spend enough time on the golf course and you keep whacking you'll take up a lot of sods of earth but every now and then you'll actually hit a good ball so I'm feeling good about it well, it's, yeah, it's always nice to mix those in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I, I must say, I must say that um, the destination analysis was probably the main um, sort of lesson I got from reading reading Nick Sleep as well. But I had I hadn't heard an analogy that good on it before, guy. So the the, the amazing one. So I'm going to borrow that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I mean, what I would tell you is that uh, we kind of shy away from from. Um, analogies between you know mating behavior human mating behavior and business because it's like fraught with the potential for you know sexual harassment suits and you name it and being named a uh a um a male chauvinist or whatever else but i think that and this is a thought that i originally got from anthony robbins the analogy is extremely powerful and there's enormous amounts that one can learn uh from looking at you know, mating strategies, human mating strategies. And I, I actually think that many of the people, and I guess I won't say all because the world is a, a, a vastly complex and variegated place, but, but many of the people who are very successful in business, uh, I believe, are either happily married or in a happy relationship. And then, you know, where does that sexual energy go? And if you can... Um, channel that sexual energy into business and you find a way to do it effectively then uh, there are enormous rewards and results and so you know um, Warren Buffett he kind of said during the 74 uh, 1974 market crash that at the end of it he was like everybody's depressed but I feel like I sex up man in a harem <laughs> you know so he's using the analogy of you know in a certain way when 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 he's buying shares of a company, I mean that's the analogy that he used, and it's a good one, you know. And and the people who in business have a glint in their eye, and they have a kind of a fun playfulness to them, they're actually they're channeling sexual energy into business, which is it's when we when we connect up to those deep motivations that we can actually shine. So I encourage more of your listeners to do that in a positive way, you know. So. There you go. I, I didn't. I didn't think we'd get on this tangent when we first hit record, but I. I don't mind it. So, <laughs> yeah. um, what, one of one of the other. I was actually just reading the uh, your annual letter that that you mentioned is now publicly available. I've been uh, reading bits of that over the last couple of days, and um, one of the interesting sections in there was talking about. Um, I believe you titled it something like uh, two companies I bought and one I didn't." Talking about BYD. And yeah. Indian Energy Exchange and um, like a French lottery company, which um, yeah. I'm, I'm blanking on the name on, but I think there were yeah. some interesting uh, Federal, lessons. Federal des Jeux. There you go. I, I think there yeah. were some really interesting lessons in there as well. There were sort of a couple of key things I got out of that. There were um, kind of position sizing. I think that's um, something we covered in the previous podcast that people really got a lot of value out of the whole analogy of whether the water's up to your ankles or your knees or your chest or over your head or that, that yeah. sort of thing. And it was interesting to see that you size those positions in, in the case of BYD and IEX at around 5%, I think, you know, yeah, a size where right. it's a size. A little where it's under five actually. Yeah. But, but at a size where it's going to be meaningful if you're right. Yeah. And um, I guess it doesn't keep you up at night. Really important. Yeah. Really, really important. Yeah, and I agree. That, yeah, and 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 um, I mean, looking looking through the fund now, I mean, I don't want to go through all individual positions and stuff, but a company like BYD has grown to be very significant for the fund. Um, it's true. Is, is that still the approach that you would take today? I mean, the BYD investment, I think, was something like eleven years ago now. 
Um, do you still have that that same sort of philosophy about opening these new positions? You know, uh, so this guy, Steve Goldstein, they should interviewed me for Market Watch. And it's really funny because he kind of picked up on this low to zero portfolio turnover. And the first statement, which I kind of really enjoyed from the conversation was that I said to him, pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> he, said, and he, he quoted that. It's um, value add, I think. Yeah, so I cited to him this study. Maybe, maybe someone listening to this can, uh, or you can actually identify or find the real story. So he didn't bring this up in the conversation, but then he wrote that uh, you know it's it's attributed to fidelity, but fidelity has no knowledge of it. So I don't know. This that's, might be yeah. a kind of an old wives' tale, and that's terrible, by the way. If that's true, so first of all, my if it's true that it's just a a, a kind of like a rumor or that circulates it's a story what do you call those stories that aren't actually true but everybody believes they're true because they've been circulating so long and i don't really want to be somebody who um participates in that i think we all have an obligation to keep us grounded in reality and if that's not a true story that's terrible and maybe somebody here can um can look it up and tell me and correct me if i'm wrong so there I am crowdsourcing my knowledge through you, Tom. I love it. Uh, but the story is that um, the portfolios of dead people perform. So now I'm repeating it. And I, I just really hope there is some basis and fact in it. The portfolios of dead people perform better than the portfolio, many portfolios of live people. And the answer is because they, uh, they are static. They don't do anything. And, and the bottom line is, some companies go bankrupt, many companies do nothing, but one or two are runaway successes and those carry the whole portfolio. And if that's true, then what we want to do is not risk a lot for a little. The opposite, we want to risk meaningful amounts, but where each amount, because we don't know which bucket it'll fall into. Well, the investment that we make, obviously we make the investment hoping it's going to be a multi-bagger, but we don't know, we can't predict. So we... We, we need to be aware that there's a certain chance that it will go bankrupt. There's a certain chance that we'll do nothing. But we need to be in a position that if God willing, if we're really lucky and it's number three, then, then we can hold on to it for a long time. So what we want to do is we want to risk enough that it's meaningful, but not so much that it wipes us out. And by the way, wiping us out just does not just mean in, on a portfolio basis. It also means psychologically in in Laboratory Corporation of America, I was wiped out. Cycle, or I allowed myself to wipe. I, I allowed me to wipe myself out in that position psychologically. It was a psychological wipeout, not a financial wipeout. You just want to keep making these bets that are meaningful and allowing them to unfold the way they unfold, which, of course, is one of my big takeaways from Berkshire is that this is all that Warren's doing all day long. And he's doing it both in private businesses and in public businesses. And some of them worked out spectacularly well. And some of them don't, you know. And if they don't, they don't. That's okay. You know, and that doesn't mean the people are bad. It doesn't mean, you know, your process is a good process. So uh, for me, that's the 5% is a great place to be. Great place. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that, that, that still holds for me. And uh, I think it's kind of probably a formula of success for the rest of one's life, actually. Um, mm. yeah all right uh, i think this i think this might be a good opportunity to maybe transition into some of these uh youtube questions because we've, we've got um we've got an interesting question which i think kind of ties into this discussion um and the question basically goes if you were to start again uh would you focus on compounders from the start or would you take even the same philosophy to position sizing if you were to start from very small a, a very small capital base um so uh yeah i would definitely focus on compounders i think it's a spectacular place to be and um i would not just be looking in the tech space i'd be looking everywhere and there's lots of evidence that the compounders can come from many different places and what a great way to live and invest you know absolutely and so I, I did it. I think I didn't inadvertently have some of those. Um, some I ridiculously sold, like Crizzle, which was just a huge mistake. Some I had taken out of my portfolio against my will, like Duff and Phelps, and um, but some I managed to hold on to. You know, BYD would be one. Berkshire would be another. 
Moody's would be another, uh, MasterCard would be another, and you know, you don't need a many of them for your life to be a financial success. So it's a really, really good way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did, that's not all I did. So I played around with Japanese net nets and I own shares of Euroton. Not, I own the, 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 um, uh, debt credit of Eurotunnel. And so I, I did a bunch of other things which didn't work out as well. Right. You know? Um, we've got another interesting question here. This is from Gage Sanchez again from YouTube. Um, he says, uh, we often hear value investors discuss the emotional and mental fortitude needed, uh, which is absolutely critical, uh, he said. Um, but where does Guy advise we look for the technical and fundamental skills needed to analyze and value businesses? Yeah, so if I just stay with the emotional fortitude, I think the only thing that I would add to that is that don't make it difficult for yourself. The The answer is not find yourself in a position where you're ch challenged mentally and emotionally and then try and plow through that the challenge the, the goal is to never put yourself in this situation where you're challenged mentally and emotionally and that's got all to do with destination analysis position sizing which businesses you're in so don't look for the very thing that you're fearful of and then put yourself where you you're fearful of it and you're actually in that position and then life sucks that's not the goal if you like you know i the the, the answer i want to give on the technical side is I, I, you know, I, I, my apologies to whoever asked the question because it's kind of snarky. And the answer is, if you got to ask the question, then maybe you're in the wrong thing. Because, um, you know, if, you're, if your mind is capable of that, of it, your mind will naturally find it. And if you're asking where to look, you know, it would be like, and this is just, uh, you know, it's it's riffing on something that Charlie Munger said. If if I go to Mozart and I say, "Hey, can, I want to get the technical knowledge as to how to compose symphonies," where do I look for it? And it's like, you know, Mozart's answer is, "You, you screwed, man." <laughs> so you know, I I just think that. So is, maybe that's too snarky, but you know, I I th there's a guy who asked me today. He tweeted to me. And and he said, uh, and I for some reason I answered it. He asked he asked me what what's a book that I can read that will teach me about insurance and banking, and and my answer was, in a certain way I had the same feeling. I was like, if you're asking me about what book to read about insurance and banking, then you know you're you're barking up the wrong tree because the answer is not in one book. And um, so you know what I told him was I said, look, read everything by and about. Or, I gave him four names of people in insurance and banking. I gave him Warren Buffett, Tom Gaynor, Charlie Munger, Jamie Dimon, Brian Moynihan. And I said, you know, read everything you can that's been written by them and read everything that is written about them. So, you know, in the case of Warren Buffett, you've got at least two or three biographies and, you know, you've got all the annual letters of the Berkshire Hathaway. And then you can dive in, you know, Rockford International, Rockford, Illinois Bank. You can go and read all of their annual reports. And, you know, and then when you're done, or if you you know add anybody relevant that can't, you come across along with any institutions relevant that you come across, so you know I think that's a pretty good program, and maybe it's helpful for that person to tell them what you need to learn. You're not going to find in the textbook. So if you think there's some university textbook that's going to give it to you, the university textbooks are written by professors who are writing for a very different reason. But my answer to all of those people is read everything. You know, and read intelligently. Read the first thing that's in front of you. And if it's, you know, if you know the stuff that's in there, then spend less time on it. If you don't know the stuff that's in there, then spend more time on it. And then acquire new reading, new stuff, new stuff to read, and just keep freaking going, you know? And so uh, there's, no, there's no shortcuts. I don't know if that's a... Uh, and the answer on the technical knowledge is start... You know, so this is, sorry, I'm getting all sort of like, start with the A's. You know, yep. what does that mean? Start with what's in front of you and and just keep going. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if, you know, I I travel around with, I mean, I, I like, I don't want to try and move the camera, but this kind of might be interesting. So... 
I just I just got to uh, I just got to London, and uh, my assistant's here with me this time, and uh, she had to travel with thirty kilograms worth of uh, printed out <laughs> documents. So, you know, what is on my read? And this I got like sort of piles and piles. You can see these piles behind me. Uh, you know, this is I don't know, Tom. Stop me if you don't if this is not relevant. But uh, I got a transcript here of um, Kindrel. It's a, it's an interview with a, a research service called Tegas. Mm -hmm. So uh, I kept this thing from uh, the Financial Times: How Trump's reshaped the courts. I wanted to reread it. I'd read it once. Um, ben Thompson. He he writes Stratechery. Uh, he wrote in 2017 something called the local, local news business model. I've read it once. I kept it to reread. The document's marked up a little bit. Um, uh, this is also by, by Ben Thompson, Tech and Liberty, written in 2019. What do we have here? Uh, um, uh, this is the Lex column from FT Weekend on Royal Estate, Crown Estate, Royal Docks. You know, Jeremy Deal, you interviewed Jeremy Deal. I got Jeremy Deal's letter on Spotify here. Uh, so I'm reading his letter on Spotify. It not, I've already read it, but I'm rereading it. Here we have, I'll stop in a minute. I have uh, a guy called Nick Martin that I met through Tom Gaynor at the Markel brunch. I met him there in Omaha. I want to meet him for a uh, coffee in London. Uh, he runs a fund called Polar Capital. You know, on the back, this is kind of the fund tear sheet. Uh, he's got he's got listed here. I guess this is public knowledge because it's published. So um, you know, I see Chubb, Marsh, McLennan, Arch Capital, Markel, and various other companies. A company called Essent Group. You know, R one's annual report. Uh, sorry, should I keep going, Tom? This is uh, great. I know that you, people. You know, you know one one of the one of the comments we got on the last podcast is. I just really enjoy this casual conversation where, you know, guys, <laughs> guys throwing up his notebook on the screen, you know, it's, it's great. <laughs> so I'll do just a little bit more here. Here's a, here's a book that I ripped apart, something on responsibility. I decided to reread it. And uh, uh, here's an economist that I didn't get to. Uh, some real estate stuff that, you know, I thought maybe it'd be nice to look at houses in Zurich. So uh, there's a company called Power Grid. It's an Indian company. I got a bunch of uh, printouts. Then I got any reports from, um, uh, this is a, an Indian company called Posico, any reports. So, uh, you know, I'll do one more is, uh, uh, Moody's investor day presentation. And uh, now I'm making a mess on my desk. What's, <laughs> what's my point to, uh, the, um, the, just like, just, you know, if you think if you think that you need technical knowledge, go buy a university textbook and read the whole freaking textbook, or stop reading the textbook when you find something else, or put it aside. And um, I, I'll just share it because I think I, I've kind of figured this out, and maybe we'll save some people. So literally, the way I so I I will I will the stuff that I've got to read will go on the right of me. So when I'm done with this, I'll just show you. You know this. Swiss Swiss company guide. This is kind of like a um, a value line for Switzerland, mm -hmm. and um, so I'll I'll put it on the right. I'll I'll read, I'll mark up. I will uh, then put it into one of two. One of like um, some of it will have action required. So I'm responding to something, or I want to order more materials, annual report, or uh, some of it will be to read later. So I'll kind of like take things like I, I may take the Posico annual report, mark it up. This is printed out. And then I'll get rid of extraneous pages, but I might keep the letter, the investor letter, for example. And then I put it back for my future self to read at some future date. So I'm kind of like reminded of it. And then mm -hmm. I'm writing stuff up in, um, in various places. I write stuff up in Evernote. I write stuff up in Rome Research. I keep notebooks, so I have uh, usually Moleskine notebooks. I also write stuff in. I write stuff in um, on uh, three by five cards. But the whole point of all of those things is basically taking care of my future self, giving my future self something to read. So my my answer to somebody who says, "Where do I get the technical knowledge?" is 
you know, sorry, one last thing. I know I'm kind of like, um, I'm on a bit of a roll here, uh, is I will never forget during the first or the second Gulf War, I don't remember which it was, a general called Norman Schwarzkopf, and um, he's in a press conference, and he said, yes, we're, we've invaded Kuwait, and we're going to take it back from the Iraqis. And um, he had a map behind him. And the journalist says, you know, we're curious, did you go by sea or did you go by land? Did you go, you know, did you do a flanking movement around? Uh, you know, and, and Norman Schwarzkopf, who's a kind of like a very powerful and strong personality, looks straight at the journalist and he says, he doesn't say, sir, but you kind of, I imagine him saying, sir, we're going over, under, around, on top, every which way that you can think of, we're doing it, which is kind of in a certain way saying, when I'm not answering the question, because that might be a military secret, because the operation was ongoing. But it's also saying every which way, you know, and so this is a very long answer to the question. But I would just also add one more thing, Tom, and it's I'm answer, I'm keeping going because Tom's smiling. So I presume that's okay to go on. So um, when I was about 22, I went on a kayaking uh, trip with a, so I went in the Duance Valley and I was interested in kayaking and I didn't know much about kayaking. And I went through a, a day or so of training how to go through white water rapids in a kayak. And one of the exercises was that you sort of sat on land on a, on a berm of soil uh, about you know, three meters above the river, not white water river, just sort of like um, calm water. And uh, you literally, sort of, he came to sort of throw you off so that the kayak would land in a random way and hopefully you'd find a way with your paddles to gain your balance and to go to a floating position with you in the kayak. Of course, if you got it wrong, you could end up underwater and uh, climbing out of the kayak, but it was kind of like a preparation. So he's um, about the the teacher's about to sort of push me off the berm and into the water, and uh, and I say, wait, wait, what do I, what do I do when I hit the water? And as he's pushing me off, he says, you improvise, you know. <laughs> and so you know, th- th- so my answer is improvise. Get what's in front of you. Yeah, you know, you got the idea. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, I like it. <clears throat> that this question might be along similar lines, but yeah. um, it's it's quite a long one. I'll try and shorten it up here, but it, it's kind of to the effect of when you're evaluating a company, um, how much time would you spend, sort of right in the micro, focusing on that particular company versus the general industry? And I mean rightly or wrongly people tend to generalize entire countries sometimes uh china's quite a topical one at the moment um how, how do you think about balancing that kind of microeconomics versus the broader kind of setting where that business operates i mean i i don't i don't think about it in those terms at all <laughs> which okay. is fine i think that's a very structured way of thinking of it it's kind of putting things into neat buckets you know macro versus micro for example mm-hmm. how much time do you spend and um uh i think that the world's way more confusing and complicated than that i think that the way i see it is that i'm trying to so the amount that one can know about the world one the amount that one could know about any particular company is kind of in a certain way infinite it's way more than any human could spend a lifetime on. You know, I spoke to somebody about one of our Indian positions. She'd done like a week or two's worth of reading and literally eight hours a day reading documents from publicly available websites in India. And then she'd gone and taken about a week to do an incredible write-up, which may end up going out in, uh, in one of my email newsletters. And, um, uh, and then we spent like two hours talking about it. And we'd barely scratched the surface. And I'm doing this full time, and that's just one company, and I had her help. And so uh, the amount we can know about the world, about any specific situation is infinite, let alone the whole world. And I think that the way, um, the way I see it is that within that infinity of, um, of uh, potential knowledge and a potential axes of exploration, 
I am constantly trying to push back the boundaries of my understanding. And, um, you know, I may be foraging around if we take the, imagine that uh, it's sort of like this is kind of in a rainforest. I may be foraging around examining one particular part of the rainforest and developing an incredibly detailed knowledge until I realize that actually my efforts are better spent in some other area. And so, and then if you, if you kind of like, I, and so what, what am I doing? I am, I am looking and examining things all the time and I'm trying to work out, I'm trying to learn from what I'm looking at examining. I'm trying to hold on to things that might be useful for a later date. And I just keep going. And there are things that will happen, like I, I might categorize, you know, so, so to say all macros useless, uh, for example, which is something that Warren has said, uh, may be in that very broad brush stroke true. But uh, there may be some people who are classified under macro who are particularly interesting to read. Uh, I find myself profoundly disagreeing with pretty much everything that Paul Krugman says. But I think that he's worth reading. Uh, and I think that, by contrast, I find myself agreeing with just about everything that Larry Summer says. And I think that he's worth reading. But let's say there's a category of macro commentary that comes from fund managers. And I find none of that useful. So I, I discard that pretty quickly. Except I continue to read it when it comes across my desk, because maybe somebody's talking about something different, or maybe I, I learned something. And, um, and I cannot categorize how much time I'm spending on any particular thing. And, you know, you saw that I have this uh, Tegas thing up. So I've suddenly discovered Tegas, and I fi do find Tegas um, useful. So suddenly, there's a new avenue of exploration that I can use. And I sort of think, well, how about using Tegas? to kind of learn more. But then I also email people or message people on LinkedIn to see if I can learn more about a particular industry from them, or I'll, I'll have somebody, or I will write up a white paper or some thoughts on it, and I'll send it out in an email, or I'll put it out on Twitter to see what, you know, sort of like to engage this idea of learning in public, where you share what you've learned, and then you see what you get back. And I get messages in from people on Twitter, I got a message in from a guy and I'm embarrassed because I don't even remember his name, but he sent me a link to a guy, Jean-Noël Kapfer, Kapferer, who's a French expert in luxury goods. So suddenly I've got three books by a French expert in luxury goods that I'm reading. And then I go to JSTOR. I don't know if you know JSTOR. JSTOR is so much fun. It's a repository of academic papers. And uh, I realized that he's written a whole bunch of stuff on... So, you know... I. I, for everyone's benefit, Tom's still smiling, so I think it's okay to keep going. <laughs> so that you know, it it's the world is confusing, and we're foraging. And uh, you know, it's like it's like asking the forager, "Do you look for green nuts and brown or brown nuts?" And it's like, well, I'm looking for any nuts that I can find, and then I try and taste them to figure out they're poisonous. If they taste bitter, maybe I'll leave them alone. You know, and so yeah, makes sense. And my yeah. answer to the person just just you know. I think that, um, you know, get out of the mentality that we ha we get from schools and universities where there's a reading list, where there's a set syllabus where you cover it. No, we're we're exploring the Antarctic, we're exploring the polar regions. We're we're now on our own, and so trust yourself, trust your inner curiosity. Don't don't look for in a certain way in that regard. Don't look for somebody to tell you what to do. Decide yourself. And in a certain way, maybe my answer to those two questions, this question and the previous one is, you're on your life's journey. Don't let somebody tell you what the path is. It's your path. And forgive me, I, I've said this many times. It's such a beautiful idea. And so everybody's listening to this. Go buy every book by Joseph Campbell you can buy and read it. He's a really incredible, wonderful guy who married one of his students who was a dancer, but um, that be aside. Uh, so he says, and I believe it's him, I'm not an academic, so you know, uh, I got Steve Goldstein from Market Watch telling me that this academic work that I've cited it doesn't exist. Somebody's going to find out about this, but I'm, I'm reasonably sure that this is Joseph Campbell. He says, you enter the forest at the darkest place where there is no path, because if there was a path, it wouldn't be your path. And we each have to make our own path. 
And so, you know, in a certain way, underlying these questions is somebody saying to me, hey, guy, what's the path? And my answer is, even if I knew the path, it's my path. You pick your path. And don't ask me, I don't know, for you. And actually, I would tell you that when I have people doing kind of research, they kind of will ask me that those kinds of questions, and I give them the same answer. I say, I don't want to tell you what to look at. I don't want to tell you what the right way to look at this industry is or which companies to look at even because I want to find out what you think. I don't want to find out what I told you to think and whether you agree with it or not or whether you – I want you to start from scratch, you know? So, yeah. This one's hey, changing. Hey, look, I'll tell you – look, I, I'll give you – why do I like you, Tom? I'll tell you one of the reasons why I like you. Now, I'm asking you, you, I'm asking a question and answering it. You're on your own path. You're leading. You are a leader. You don't know where you're going, but you know it's your path. You, I don't know exactly where it came from that you decided to do this podcast. I don't know where it came from that you decided to come to the Berkshire meeting. But you are on a path that it's clear to me that nobody is telling you what to do. You didn't wake up one day and say, I want to be, do a pod, you know, I'm going to ask XYZ person how to do a podcast, how to run a YouTube channel, how to be. No, you're following your curiosity. It's so obvious. That's actually part of what makes it fun to talk to you because you're alive. You're making decisions. You don't know what you'll be doing tomorrow in three weeks or two years from now, but you're, you're exploring your forest in a certain way. And it's a beautiful thing when you get it because you're kind of there doing it. And so uh, that's my answer. And here's a mistake that I have made it's not um, fatal, thankfully, but it's kind of like a serious mistake in life is that I've made decisions as if I'm, because I was so in love with Warren Buffett, I've been making all these decisions in my portfolio that is that it doesn't come from exactly where I stand. It's maybe what somebody with Warren Buffett's resources would do if he was managing my portfolio, perhaps. But what... What is actually right for me, there are many small cap companies that I haven't looked at because I've been too busy aping Warren Buffett. But I have to actually look, it's my path. It's not Warren Buffett's path. It's not Lou Simpson's path. My path, you know? And to the extent that I found that, I've been better and more successful. And you're clearly on your own path. And so my exhortation to those two questions is try and find a way to be on your path. And the way you get on that path is... I can't, you know, is look inside yourself. You know, in the, in the words of that famous book by the Google engineer, search inside yourself, the answers are on the inside. Um, nobody knows which is the right step for you to take. Nobody knows which is the right textbook to pick up anymore. Nobody knows which is the right company to study. And, and you don't know yourself, but, you, but every now and then you'll get clues. You know, Tom has to decide who he's going to interview. And, he, and I know that Tom doesn't just do it based on how many views they get. He looks inside himself. You, you decide, what do my instincts tell me is the right way to go forward? It's a beautiful thing, actually. I just realized it right now. Back to you with a question. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just quickly say it's, it's more fun to just do your own thing and talk to interesting people rather than just try to get the, the most clicks. But um, it's a Yes, fun. so here's, a, here's <laughs> what is really fascinating, Tom, that, uh, again, I'm not, um, I, I, I'm a lay person in all of these things, but I know that there's a more than a kernel of truth in it is that, um, your path. So curiosity is not just some weird thing that's out there. It's a ver there's, there's processes going on in our minds that are leading us somewhere, somewhere good, somewhere that, uh, somehow deep inside ourselves or somewhere wherever the hell it is. So, so um, follow your curiosity because your curiosity will lead you to a good place. Follow your instincts. Don't assume that anything is extraneous uh, and, and not something to be ignored. You know, that also goes for the negative sense. And I, I feel compelled to share this. I, I hope it's relevant in some weird way. So, so, so it, you know, you sit in a room. I'm in a room. Somebody piques my curiosity and a friend tells me, oh, that person's boring and not interesting. Don't listen to the friend. Listen to the curiosity. Don't assume that the reason why that person caught your interest will be obvious to you right away. Follow that lead and see where it leads until you know that it's not the right path for you and then stop. 
that also goes in the negative. The famous, or for me, this kind of impacted me so much to hear the story. So you're a woman, you've worked late at night, and you're leaving your office, say, 9 o'clock, and you're on the 10th floor of a 20-story building, and you walk to the elevator, uh, you know, all that there is is there is a security guard downstairs, and you don't know if he's there anymore, floors are deserted, and you, the elevator door opens, and there's a male figure standing in the elevator, and you get this feeling of, um, I don't know if that's safe. And then immediately, because let's say you're a woman living in a developed country, you say, this is ridiculous. I'm a female. I should feel safe leaving the office at nine o'clock at night. Uh, I should not be worried about this shadowy male figure in the elevator. I'm going to step in the elevator. And self-defense says, you don't step into the elevator. Even though 999 times out of a thousand, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that man in the elevator. He has He bears no ill will to you, all those things. But you don't go into the elevator because one time out of 999, it could actually lead to an unpleasant circumstance. And all you have to do is step away, go to the bathroom, let the elevator pass, and step into a different elevator where there's no shadowy man standing inside. That's listening to your instincts. That's an act of self-defense in that case. And I, I, I was watching some self-defense course. That is an act of self-defense, listening to the instincts, not ignoring that feeling of, I'm not sure this is right for me. And overriding that feeling of, well, I should be allowed to do that uh, and just go with the self-defense and the instinct. On the positive side, don't let a friend or somebody who's well-meaning override those instinctual short thoughts about where you should be because that will lead you to the promised land. And that's what's led you to kind of your promised land because you're living the dream in a certain way, Tom. You're having a blast. I can see it. You're having so much fun, you know? Yeah. So, so And it's special when you connect up to people like that. So. You know, it's strange. You ask these questions, you don't know where the hell it's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, I've got absolutely no clue where this question's going to go. So <laughs> this is this is one of our most most thumbs thumbs up to questions on YouTube. So it says uh, this is from James. He says, uh, "If Guy wasn't a fund manager, what would he be doing?" Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question, James. Um, so. Uh, the first thing that you need to know, and I and I say it, I've said it multiple times, and I say it with great seriousness. Um, uh, there are people like Monish Pabrai, who was an extraordinarily successful businessman. He sold his business, he put money in the bank, and then he started investing that money. I am in awe of people like that. Uh, you know, I was born. I'm in a certain way a second generation of a of a relatively small but successful business run by my father. He was my first investor. Uh, if I had not been born into those circumstances, I'm not sure that I would have either been, you know, kind of to the extent that you think of what I'm doing as being entrepreneurial. I don't think I'm not sure that I would have been an entrepreneur, and uh, I'm not sure that I would have been in the investment management business. I think I might have become an investment banker, and who knows that would have led where that would have led. Maybe I would have been some faceless, gray-suited guy working at Goldman Sachs or elsewhere, uh, or trying to work in the you know trying to find my way to work for Jamie Dimon or a department blessed by Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan or something like that. Uh, I had been in the consulting industry, and I might have been in the consulting industry for the longest time. So I think that I might well have ended up in those places. I asked myself. I actually think that I'm really good in unstructured situations. I've seen in, in with not-for-profits, I get, I, I'm capable of getting involved when the thing is just an idea and a sketch. And the minute the thing gets to fruition and it becomes kind of a solid thing, I have less of a role to play and I'm actually not interested in playing a role. So maybe I would have been involved in the formation of startup companies. And I think that possibly where I would have ended up is as an academic as an academic and or teacher of some kind. And, you know, I don't know if I would have made it to being a, a named prof tenured professor. So maybe I just would have been a lecturer or, or a teacher in some role or capacity, but uh, uh, maybe I would have ended up there. And then the last thought for James is that I think it's a really interesting question to ask uh, whose life would you like to be living not because one ought to live that life, but because it give, cl gives clues about what direction we should take in life. And um, I don't know why. I mean, it's it's come up for me less less um, recently, but in the past, and it's not anything to do with investing. I 
I think that Steven Spielberg, I, I kind of like in a certain way, uh, not so envious that I wanted to give up what I was doing, but the, the creation of these amazing stories and, and thinking through how to communicate on the deepest um, uh, archetypal level with, with movies like Close Encounters and Star Wars, I believe, maybe that wasn't him actually, but some archetypal movies. You see, I don't know that much about the movie industry. More recently, the place where my envy goes is people who've been great essayists. So um, George Orwell, Montaigne, uh, I just came across a book that I've just ordered, The Essays of Virginia Woolf. And um, and so I find myself, and, and actually this guy, Paul Graham, who writes online, and actually another guy called David Perel, and I, I tell myself, or Tyler Cowan, they're people you know who've kind of think about the world and have written really insightful pieces about the world from a generalist standpoint. So, you know, that's something that I, I still aspire to be able to maybe do, but I don't know if I'll achieve it or succeed. It's extraordinarily hard to do. So I don't know if that helps, James. That's very interesting. I, I had no clue where that where that answer was going to go. So that's cool to hear. <laughs> Let, let's, let's do, let's do one more. Um, you're you're quite well known for attending a certain lunch a few years ago, um, but we we do have a question uh, basically asking, um, and your answer may be the lunch you've already been to. I'm I'm not sure, but um, the question essentially is if you could choose three people dead or dead or alive to have lunch with, who who might they be? Oh, what a great question! What what a spectacular question! Um, I haven't thought about that much recently. Um, so, so with the caveat that this is not well thought through and it's kind of off the cuff, um, one of the first people that comes to well, the, one of the first people that comes to mind who's actually historical is um, is Abraham Lincoln. I think that I think that he showed uh, extraordinary and almost infinite wisdom um in his actions and uh so i think that he would have you know and i think that from from all that i know about him and the one book that i've read about him and a couple of movies that i've seen the capacity to to to, to uncover a wise action from a morass of difficulties is something that he seems to have repeatedly done through one of the most difficult periods of american history so uh, i think he's an extraordinary leader on a practical level and i think that so that that kind of appeals to me. Now, if we go to people who may be historical, maybe not. I mean, I, I you know, I would have liked to have talked to Moses, but then who wouldn't have liked to have talked to Moses? You know, he's in in the Jewish tradition. There's kind of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our Rabbi. You know, so but I, you know, there's there's questions about whether that that human really existed. He's just a character in a work of literature called the Bible. So, but I'll throw him in there just for fun. I think I should stay with historical figures, and um, it's funny because because of, you know Mahatma Gandhi comes up for me, but I almost feel like I know what he would say, and I think that in a certain way he was kind of impractical. Yes, his nonviolence and wisdom worked in the British Empire, but I don't think it would have worked against the Russians, and I don't think it would have worked against the Nazis, and I don't think that. And he had this correspondence with Adolf Hitler, or at least he wrote letters to Adolf Hitler. Uh, calling Adolf Hitler his friend, and I think that there was a kind of um, you know, idealism there that was not justified. Um, so I, you know, boy, I my, I range over so many different places, and I I, I kind of think of great historical figures. So um, you know, I not that I would have liked him, but I but who would not want to have met Napoleon, you know, and to have talked to him. And to have had that interaction, except that I think it would have would have become a worse person for having met with and talked to Napoleon because he was a. I hope his descendants aren't upset. He was kind of a nasty little man in a certain way, and it's not very nice of me to say little, but he, we know that he was short. Ah, uh, um, and I'm kind of ranging around all over the place. I keep going to American presidents, but I've named, I, I you know, and and I have maybe this betrays the time that I've spent in the US. Benjamin Franklin would have been an amazing guy to hang out with. 
no question and and hopefully to become friends with um yeah you know we, we, we people who lee kuan yu has been mentioned many many times that that guy um uncovered enormous amounts of wisdom in himself and i think that what's extraordinary about lee kuan yu is that he himself would not have claimed to be a great intellect if you like uh so that kind of is special because because we can all we none of us most of us don't have great intellects but we still aspire to greatness and so i think that lee kuan yu is a guy who achieved greatness without having to rely on extraordinary intellect to get there um i think that what's interesting for me is and i'll bring this little flight of fancy to a close is that i'm not actually talking about the world's greatest minds because in a certain way many of the world's greatest minds have left a legacy in their writings that one is is almost as good as being with them in life if you like because what the best of their minds have been shared in writing uh and so you know but i think that the people who have married insight with action and have been practical philosophers and have 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 dealt with the world not from the safety of an ivory tower even though they they might have engaged with the world from that ivory tower in a very profound way and another came name comes up for me Isaiah Berlin who was a very beloved philosopher who who many state world leaders met with him because they wanted to get uh the interaction with him but people people who are out in the arena i guess you know there there's the famous quote by i don't know which american president the man in the arena it's not the spectators it's the man who's out there I think that the meetings with those people who actually lived the battle in one way or another of getting the right action but brought their thoughts to bear is kind of like inspiring. Shackleton. I would have liked to have met Shackleton. I could go on and on. You see the more I think the more people come up but uh, Yeah, you you're going to have to get rid of a few to get back down to 3 now. But <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not possible with any of them, so you know, I'll just let yeah. it be. <laughs> Look, guy, um, this was a lot of fun. I, I really appreciate your time and uh, returning to the podcast. Um, it's much appreciated. It's always a lot of fun talking to you, and I know people enjoy uh, listening to to what you've got to say as well. So um, I appreciate that. I, I know that you you already mentioned your letters are now publicly available. I know you've been a little more active on YouTube. Uh, I know you're on Twitter as well. Is there anywhere you want to plug before we, before we wrap this up? <laughs> No, that's really kind. Um, no, I, I'm really, I, I'm kind of, you know, so I have to preface this with a famous statement, apparently by Golda Meir, Israeli Prime Minister. Have I told this to you already, Tom? So he's nodding. So Tom, as soon you'll realize that I have just like a limited repertoire of things I just keep repeating, just talk I'm to not my sure wife. I've heard this one. You. So Golda Meir, uh, First woman prime minister that I know of, even before Margaret Thatcher, maybe not before Indira Gandhi in India, but um, so in a cabinet full of males, and she says apparently reported, maybe somebody can find out if this is true or not, and correct me if it's not, and get me the quote if it is. But the story I have in my mind is she says to her cabinet, "Don't be so modest. You're not that great." which i don't know there's a kind of like uh, you know and they're all running around being falsely modest and she's like you know you only get the right to be falsely modest when you're way greater you know stephen hawking gets to be falsely falsely modest <laughs> mahatma gandhi you little ministers who just like sort of have crawled over each other to get a post in the israeli government cabinet you don't get to be show modesty because you're not that great and um so i i'm just amazed that people want to listen to me and as i said to tom a little bit just before is this um i you know I, i'm kind of expecting the interest to drop off at some point and and it's like yeah well guys just repeating himself i didn't learn anything new so we'll see but it's exciting for me as well because uh, the and and forgive me if this idea has already been expressed but when when we consume whatever google searches uh tiktok instagram twitter youtube we are we our attention is being used by the algorithm 
our attention is being delivered by the algorithm to people who are paying for our attention uh, much of the time. But when we create content, even just a Twitter thread, you know, three takeaways from the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, three takeaways from the book that I read, when Tom creates content, when I agree to come and talk to you, then there's the possibility for the algorithm to be put to my use. So now the algorithm is going to take this content of me and Tom and feed it based on, you know, artificial intelligence, based on heuristics that we didn't even know exactly what they are. It's going to figure out based on somebody else's activity, which of the 7 billion people on this planet need to watch this particular video. So I'm part of the benefit for me for doing this is that there is the, I was, I was going to say the possibility, but it's actually the likelihood that I will get connected up to people that I otherwise would not have been connected up to that are going to be positive in my life. And so, you know, if you're one of those people, thank you for listening in and feel free to get in touch with me via any of the above mentioned channels. So there is a kind of a benefit. And I think my point is to anybody who's listening to this, creating content is a non zero sum game, which is really beautiful. So that, you know, I have a podcast. The fact that I have a podcast does not detract from what Tom's up to at all. And if you learn something from Tom or from me or from elsewhere, you know, share it in whatever form you do. It doesn't matter if share it in an essay, share it in a tweet, share it in a, a video, because you will now be putting the algorithm to use and uh, for yourself, for your benefit. So I don't know. I could, I could wax lyrical, Tom. <laughs> Guy, I, I just a... I'd have made myself stop because I would have gone I would have rambled on to something else, you know. Uh, you're you're fine. This was uh this was a lot of fun, guy, and uh, we'll we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Tom. Enjoy. Tell me, tell tell me and the viewers what's it like in New Zealand right now. What's the weather like? What's the atmosphere? What's going on? Uh, yep, we're just coming into winter. So I we finished our US trip in Texas. We're um, I'm go it was about 35 degrees Celsius most days. And then I got off the plane in Auckland and it was like a frost, you know, car window was frozen the next morning type thing. So that was a little bit of a shock to the system. So we're just coming into winter, but we have yeah. very mild winters. Um, Are you planning on going skiing summer. or anything? Not much of a skier. Um, <clears throat> I I try to spend as, as much time as I can as far north as possible in New Zealand where it's a little warmer. So yeah, that's where I tend to hang and, out. And, uh, you know, if I, if I can turn it around just for you a little bit, I don't know, sure. you maybe share this, but um, <laughs> top, top present company excluded uh, top three meetings from the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, three people that had the biggest impact on you uh, and um, three things that you learned or three takeaways from you. This is really fun. I'm now interviewing Tom. Go on. <laughs> um, yeah, I, the, the Matt Peterson barbecue was a lot of fun. And then we spent, um, I mean, we spent a few hours with, with Matt in Austin. Uh, my friend Brandon recorded a video for his YouTube channel. We did a hour or so podcast with Matt and then, you know, went to lunch and everything. So it was a lot of fun hanging out with Matt. Um, and what did we learn from Matt? We learned a lot of things about what what the practicalities of running a fund. I guess I knew knew a lot about his investment strategy, but it was interesting to hear about um about what running a fund is like. Had a had a good chat with William Green um oh. at, at your meet and greet, and then also a little bit of, at the dinner. Um, we're actually I've told the story on another podcast, but we're actually waiting for an Uber. Um, kind of after straight after your dinner, I was waiting for an Uber to go to the place we were staying at, and I um, was chatting to William Green, and then Bill Gates just wandered past, which was a little <laughs> bit of a surreal experience. <laughs> but that kind of stuff happens in Omaha once a year, apparently. Um, and met a ton of people just that watched the channel way more than I expected would kind of come up and say hi. So that was very cool. Um, and we also got to stand in line with a guy called Brett Kelly. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Brett, but I'm he runs an account, he ru he runs an accounting firm that's listed on the Australian Stock Exchange called Kelly Partners. Um, and he's a big Buffett fan, so it was interesting just kind of talking business at 
four in the morning in the Berkshire line with him too. Did you say, and you, presumably you, you handed out business cards, received business cards, you've got ways of staying in touch with all of those people. Uh, yeah, I said, just just look me up, investing with Tom, and my face will pop up somewhere. <laughs> That's really yeah. great. Well, it's fun to reconnect after the Berkshire meeting with you here, Tom, and as you can see, maybe next time I'll ask you more questions. You never yeah, know. that'd be good. <laughs> yeah, we'll turn the tables a little bit. I, I should also just say thank you because I think that um, you're, you're providing a valuable service to many, many people. And uh, you're, I think that what you may not realize, or maybe you do, so you in a certain way are the subject of the podcast or the, the YouTube channel because the audience tunes into your curiosity and they tune into your mind. And so what you become interested in and where your curiosity takes you is in a certain way part of the content. And so, you know, I urge you, I was saying it for other people, I urge you to kind of really sort of say, well, what am I curious about? What do I want to learn about? And follow that. And I don't know if, you know, I'll just re-mention him. Tyler Cowan's an amazing guy. And he's not a value investor, but, but he's a guy who does that. Uh, very, very well. And another guy who does that very, very well, who I believe works at Microsoft, but he wrote a book about Charlie Munger called The Complete Investor is Trent Griffin. And what's lovely about Trent, and really I kind of tune into Trent's mind through Twitter, is that he's following what is interesting to him. and and But that is valuable content in and of itself. And uh, one last person, oh my God, I could keep going. Sorry, these are great resources that I urge you to follow and maybe you can bring them up on your podcast and maybe you can interview them. And um, so uh, other people like that, Paul Graham, I think I just talked about. Uh, he's an, an essayist and he's a, he's a venture capitalist at Y Combinator. And um, oh, Pat McKenzie who works at Stripe is also just a, a wonderful, wonderful guy. And, um, and again, each one of these people is their own person and their curiosity and what they're interested in is part of the content. And that's what you are. So I'm interested to find out who you interview because I'm interested to find out what you're interested in. So like this Kelly guy, you know, consider interviewing him. He's a, he's a CEO of a publicly traded company. I'm sure he'd be very interesting to interview especially considering you met him at the Berkshire meeting. So, Yeah, we're definitely going to make that you know, happen. We're, we're I'll live send, now. I'll send you the link. <laughs> oh, you already interviewed him? Uh, no, I'm but uh, so, uh, no, we've got that, we've, we've got that planned. So um, yeah, yeah. When, it, when it's That's ready, I'll, I'll send you the link to it. Yeah, but, but you know, and for the viewer, you, you know, if you were not at Berkshire, you missed the chance to meet Tom. And Tom is really just one hell of a personality. He's a lovely guy. I feel lucky to have met you, Tom. Really, you're too kind. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I'd just sucking up to you. Yeah, I'd better stop this episode before before too many more compliments get out into get out into the wide world. So. <laughs> In any case, I just had I just had somebody pop their nose around the door. So um, great, thank you, thank you all for putting up with me. I hope I've been helpful. If I've insulted you, I apologize. If I was impatient or short with you, I also apologize. I'm a work in progress. You know, I'm not no, perfect in a thousand different this, ways. No, this was a lot of fun, Guy. Um, we'll wrap it up here, but it's always good talking to you. And just hang on for a few seconds so that your videos upload as well, by the way. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching another episode of the Investing with Tom podcast. If you did enjoy it, be sure to hit like and also subscribe to the channel so that you can see future podcast episodes as soon as they go live.